Half a day students, I am Governor Lou Leon Guerrero. You all have been through a year of big changes. We've had to adapt and make big changes to keep our families and our islands safe. But with change comes opportunity and a chance to try new things like PBS University. While Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenori and I will continue to do our part to keep our islands safe, you students have a part to play as well. Your part is to keep learning and to keep up with your lessons. That's why I am happy to see you here ready to learn with PBS University. PBS University is a way to bring a continuous educational curriculum to you while you stay safe at home during this time. To help you keep up with your studies, we asked our friends at PBS Guam and the Guam Department of Education to put together this episode. Thank you for doing your part and have a great lesson. Humanities Guahan, an independent nonprofit organization affiliated with the National Endowment for the Humanities, is dedicated to promoting public humanities programming for the people of Guam and providing foundational support and educational resources for our island community. For more information about Humanities Guahan, visit www.humaniesguahan.org. The following webinar series is part of a project presented by Humanities Guahan entitled Unincorporated Voting Voices and Visions Padaguahan. This project explores tomorrow stories, experiences, and perspectives on civic engagement in relation to voting rights, democracy, political status, and tomorrow self-determination. Unincorporated consisted of the five-part webinar series that took place from January through May 2021 and covered topics on the origins of tomorrow self-determination, the work of the Commission on Decolonization, the relationship between art and decolonization, and the role of the U.S. legal system as it relates to Guam's political status. The project culminated with the launch of an online and printed magazine distributed throughout the community, which consists of essays, creative reflections, and artwork exploring issues around Guahan's political status and decolonization colonization through the perspectives and historical and political experiences of the Chamorro people of Guahan. Half a day and welcome. I'm Kimberly Keeling from Humanities Guahan. Thank you for joining us for this morning's webinar, Navigating the Law, Voting and Political Status Rights in Guahan with Attorney General Levin Camacho in conversation with Attorney Vanessa Williams. Their conversation will explore the history of the right to vote in Guahan, as well as contemporary court cases within the context of Guahan's political status. I also want to acknowledge and thank our Magahaga, Governor Lou Leon Guerrero, for being with us today. This is the fourth webinar in a five-part webinar series for the project Unincorporated, Voting Voices and Visions Paraguahan, which will also include a digital magazine to launch this April. Unincorporated explores Chamorro stories, experiences, and voices in relation to voting rights, democracy, decolonization, and self-determination. Humanities Guahan received a grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation in partnership with the Federation of State Humanities Councils to produce this project as part of a nationwide initiative, Why It Matters, Civic and Electoral Participation. We see ourselves as the convener, connector, and catalyst for the project as we explore why civic engagement matters through an examination of the political history of Guahan and the histories, experiences, and diverse perspectives of the island's indigenous people. Humanities Guahan is humbled and honored by the opportunity to bring this important project to our island community and to feature such outstanding guests as the Attorney General and Attorney Williams. Thank you both. Now I'm going to give a little introduction, a brief introduction to both the Attorney General and to Attorney Williams. Stephen T. Camacho is Guam's fifth elected Attorney General. 
Before being elected, the Attorney General was a solo practitioner who handled civil and criminal matters. During his long career, he's argued over 15 appeals before the Supreme Court of Guam, assisted the governments of Guam and the CNMI in reviewing complex environmental impact studies, and litigated land rights and environmental justice cases. He also served as local counsel in a lawsuit seeking to extend voting rights to U.S. citizens living in the territories. Before practicing law, Attorney General Camacho was a Guam public school science and reading teacher, network administrator in Seattle's public school system, and a fried chicken cook at a franchise restaurant in Guam. He attended John F. Kennedy High School, majored in English literature at the University of Washington, and graduated from Boston University School of Law. Attorney General Camacho and his wife, Jen, have two sons, Tanum and Tua. Vanessa Lee Williams is a Chamorro litigator and advocate for civil rights in Guam. Her law firm has spent the last 10 years representing and empowering women in a range of personal and business matters. She is also a founder and past president of the Guam Women's Chamber of Commerce, and in 2019 was recognized as the Women in Business Champion of the Year by the Guam branch of the U.S. Small Business Administration. She has taught legal research, research reasoning and writing, and law and public policy seminar at the University of Guam. She has a five-year-old daughter and another daughter on the way. So we're really privileged to have both the Attorney General and Attorney Williams with us today. And just as a short, brief housekeeping note, the Humanities Guaha staff will be fielding questions from the audience through the Zoom Q&A feature, as well as from Facebook for the Q&A part of the webinar. We ask that the audience hold their questions until then, and we will try to get to each of your questions or comments. So I'm going to turn it over now to the Attorney General, Levin Kamacha. I guess I just want to start with a disclaimer that, as Kimberly mentioned, I'm a literature major, not a history major, so I can answer questions about Percy Shelley or Lord Byron. But in terms of history and legal history, I can only speak about what I'm familiar with, and I'm going to try my best to to do that in today's presentation. Just to give an overview of what I am going to address before turning it over to Attorney Williams, just a brief overview of the Constitution and the right to vote, and then talk a little bit about how that works in the context of the territories in Guam specifically. And then I would end my portion by talking about, you know, in the context of voting and self-determination, what is it that we really should be pushing for? What are we pushing for? What are our current efforts and what other efforts may be? Again, crash course in the Constitution and the right to vote. And I've focused primarily on the 15th, 19th, 24th Amendments, as well as the Voting Rights Act of 1965. 15th Amendment, which becomes important as we talk about more recent cases, basically says that you cannot prevent someone from voting based on their race or national origin. And this is coming after the Civil War, uh, the abolition of slavery. So 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were all adopted around the same time. And you had equal protection of law, abolition of slavery, and then the right to vote. And to limit or prohibit a state from restricting or making racial restrictions on the right to vote. After that, the 19th Amendment is enacted, which is gives women the right to vote. And we last year celebrated 100 years of the 19th Amendment, and there was a lot of good work on that. But I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what that means for Guam and how that played out in Guam a little bit down the road. The 24th Amendment is enacted in 1962, and it's not one of the more popular amendments. But as we talk about and we look at recent efforts to address voting rights federally and voting efforts across the states, it becomes more important to see this deals with poll taxes and eliminating barriers essentially to people exercising the right to vote. And in particular, when you look at the 15th Amendment, the 19th Amendment, and racially, what happens when you are trying to continue to disenfranchise certain segments of the population. Voting Rights Act of 1965 is also relevant to some of the more recent cases, but that was really meant to add more teeth to what the 15th Amendment had initially sought to do and the 24th Amendment. For me, the big takeaway is 
we have the 15th Amendment, you are no longer allowed to discriminate against someone based on race and when it comes to voting. And yet we've had to continuously have federal amendments passed, federal statutes passed, local statutes, because there always will be efforts to maintain power and to disenfranchise those who may not share your political views. So how does this work with the territories? And for us in Guam and other territories, it starts with Article 4, which is an article that many of us are familiar with, but it mean, means all the world for us. And it basically says that Congress has plenary or absolute authority over the territories. This is a quote from early 1900, 1898, Guam was acquired through the Treaty of Paris. When I look at this quote and I think about a certain congressperson who made a comment about Guam being a foreign country, and rightfully there was a lot of people upset about that, but the reality is from 1900 to 2021, there are still a lot of people who will never accept those of us who are not part of the continental United States as being part of America or American and all. And it really reminded me that, you know, people are saying, oh, this is anti-American. You know, she should know that we're part of America. And this is the way that the territories have been treated historically. And you see through the development, this is a, a representative of Congress and it makes its way through in the Supreme Court of the United States. 1901, the United States is kind of continues expansion and Alaska, Hawaii are at that point territories. And there is a constitutional question of whether or not the constitution automatically extends to the territories or whether it is limited in nature. And these are the cases that are known as the insular cases and there's a series of them, but Downs versus Bidwell is, is one of the seminal ones. And for our purposes, it really points out that race was one of the primary reasons that there was a decision to not have the constitution fully apply into the newly acquired territories. And the justification was because these new territories are so racially different from those of us who are part of America, we want to slow it down a little bit and to think about our, our next actions. And some of them thought it would be benevolent, but you know, again, it really had to do with being the racial other as it continued to expand. An interesting element on this is some constitutional scholars have argued that the insular cases actually created an exit strategy for the United States. And if they acquired territories and then down the road they decided it wasn't going to be beneficial for them, they had an ability to sever ties and to allow for the territory to become independent. And an example of that would be the Philippines where they were initially a US territory and then they were able to take a different path and become independent. Insular so cases adopt what is known as the doctrine of territorial incorporation. And it identifies two types of territories, incorporated and unincorporated. If you are incorporated, there is some indicia that you are destined for statehood. And automatically, the entire benefits of the Constitution are granted to the residents of that territory. On the other side, there are unincorporated territories. And in those situations, only quote unquote fundamental personal rights would automatically be extended to the residents of those territories. Now, some of the factors that the court looked at in deciding whether you were incorporated or unincorporated in the case of Alaska was that they, Congress had extended citizenship to the residents of Alaska when it adopted their Organic Act which brings us to the issue that there is no constitutional right of, of citizenship. This is something that Congress extends. Those of us in Guam are citizens by virtue of federal law, not by the Organic Act. There has been some recent litigation uh, involving this issue with American Samoa, and there is this residents of American Samoa are, are U.S. nationals, and there is a question of whether or not the 14th Amendment automatically makes them United States citizens. And it is, as much as it sounds like a pretty straightforward question for us, it is one fraught with political tension in American Samoa because they voted. There have been votes where folks have not wanted to become U.S. citizens because of the concern that if they become U.S. citizens and the Constitution fully applies, a lot of their programs will now be subject to constitutional challenge under equal protection and other types of laws, 50th Amendment, which we've seen happen here in Guam. U.S. citizenship wasn't extended, and we talk about, okay, if we get citizenship, now we have the full benefits of the Constitution, and the answer to that is no. Just because you are U.S. citizens, you have one right, and in this case out of Puerto Rico, which dealt with the grand jury, 
They said, if you want to enjoy the full rights of citizenship, you can move to the United States. And at that point, you will have all the protections that you would be entitled to. It really was more of the right to travel and enjoy the full benefits of the Constitution. And again, Vanessa will talk a little bit about this when it comes to voting for president or having federal representation. So to, to give a timeline of how things have developed in Guam, starting with the 50th Amendment, and then we have the Treaty of Paris, which is when Guam is acquired by the United States. The 19th Amendment is adopted in 1920. We have our Organic Act, which is a significant change for Guam because at that point, we finally are given citizenship. The Voting Rights Act of 1965, and then the Elected Governors Act of 1968. Now, the reason why I think this timeline is, is very fascinating is we did not have an elected governor until 1971, I believe, was the first elected governor. So we have 100 years that go by where we have constitutional amendments prohibiting the restriction of voting based on race. We have 1920, the 19th Amendment, which prohibits you from discriminating based on gender when it comes to voting. We are given citizenship. Yes, you can discriminate against who can vote based on race and gender, but if you're completely denied the right to vote, uh, then it becomes a question of, well, Congress has that ability. And another, I, I would say interesting, at least I find it interesting, is that we did not have an organic act. Most territories get an organic act pretty quickly. We were a territory for 52 years before we had ours, and we were actually governed by an executive order that was issued and under the president's executive power. So although Article 4 talks about Congress's authority to make rules and regulations over the territories, we were the longest example of a territory that was governed by a president, essentially, and appointed by a military leader from the president for decades. So as we think about the right to vote and we think about how it has played out in Guam, we were governed and did not have an elected governor until decades after we were initially acquired by the United States and became U.S. citizens. Now, 19th Amendment is passed, then you would say, okay, women would be able to vote. It's not quite that simple. So we have a case out of Puerto Rico where after the passage of the 19th Amendment, they said women should be able to vote. There was a local statute that limited voting to men. And a constitutional challenge was brought saying, now we have this amendment the right to vote is fundamental. We should be able to participate. And the Supreme Court of Puerto Rico said, no, a woman's right to vote is not fundamental. It's a personal right. And as much as we might empathize with you, sorry, you will have to take it up with your local legislature to change that restriction. This shows the difference in the territories where no state could have discriminated against women from participating in elections. I happened to look up the case that was cited to in the Puerto Rico case. And for those of us, it's Women's History Month in Guam. We have a matrilineal society. So it was interesting to see the way that they talk about women and this experiment of what will happen. Oh, my gosh, you know, oh, dear, if, if women are allowed to vote, it could be terrible consequences. And this just shows that even something is at this moment non-controversial, a woman's right to vote for decades was extremely controversial and there was a lot of opposition to it. And the 19th Amendment, they had to fight very hard to get it passed and it barely got, I think Tennessee was the, the last state to ratify it before it was, was eventually adopted and certified. So all the things that we kind of take for granted, okay, we can't discriminate based on gender. Well, it took a lot of effort to get us to that point. The right to vote for president is not fundamental. And again, Vanessa is involved in some litigation that will address this a little bit more, but if you did not know, the Attorney General in 1984 sued the federal government, arguing that U.S. citizens living in Guam have a right to participate and to vote for president. And the Ninth Circuit said that because the presidential elections, presidents are elected by electors uh, and we are not a state, it is not a constitutional violation to not give us an opportunity to vote for president. I was not aware of it until I, I started getting involved with some of the things that Vanessa is currently involved in. I'm just gonna transition a little bit more and you're know, thinking to yourself like yogurt. And for those of you who have kids, frozen yogurt, you bring them there. And my youngest son, he just picks the most random toppings. And he also will pick random flavors. No rational human being would do that. And I, I look at this in terms of what do we really want? And I know yogurt's like, okay, what, what, what kind of flavor do you want? 
what kind of fixings do you want? In Guam, when it comes to the right to vote, we've almost reversed it where we've focused on these fixings, right? We have the right to vote. Okay, everyone can now vote for governor. We don't discriminate based on race. We don't discriminate based on gender. But at its core, the right to vote really involves the consent of the governed. And when you look at the structure of Guam and our political status as an unincorporated territory, we are like black licorice yogurt with all these beautiful fixings. Like the core itself is terrible to taste, but we have all this nice stuff on top of it. So as we think about the right to vote, and, and I think it really forces us to reflect on what do we really want as an island? Do we just want to get the right to vote for president? Do we just want a congressional delegate? Or is it something much deeper and more profound than that? Because we are ultimately at this point governed by an organic act subject to congressional change at any moment. Our citizenship is different. So when we talk about political status and self-determination and the right to vote, those are all connected because at the end of the day, the right to vote assumes that you are participating in a government that you have consented to. And, and that's what legitimizes the entire process. I'm seeing I'm speaking really fast here. I guess I have to like figure out what I'm going to do for the next 10 to 15 minutes. Maybe Vanessa will help me out. But I guess one, I wanted to show my tie because I'm very proud of it, that it's woven and you can't really see the features of it in Zoom. So yes, it's a very nice tie. And it's, it's odd, but I want to end by saying lawyers aren't going to change the world and lawyers aren't going to, well, they're not going to save the world. I will say that. And we have a lot of lawyers, you know, I'm very happy that I'm a lawyer, but I'm glad that the Humanities Council is putting this on. And when you look at how much culturally things have shifted, how we're seeing our educators teaching more about Guam history. When I was in school back in my day, we had American civics and a semester of Guam history, and we weren't really taught to be critical of our relationship with the United States and our unique place in the United States history. As I see younger people coming up, it's very exciting that this these topics are of interest when you see the arts also moving because with the national scene being what it is, and I, I'm looking at Georgia, where I These webinars can be accessed on Humanities Guahan's Facebook page. To view the online magazine associated with Unincorporated Voting Voices and Visions Paraguahan, visit humanitiesguahan.org backslash unincorporated. Half a day students, I'm Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenorio. For more than a year now, you all have continued to wash your hands and watch your distance from others, and you've done a really great job wearing your masks. We know your parents and guardians have helped you to make these changes to keep yourself and your community safe. As Governor Leon Guerrero said, we are happy you are here. We want you to continue to learn and sharpen your skills with the help of PBS University. This program is the result of a collaborative effort. We couldn't do it alone. I'd like to thank the teachers and support staff of the Guam Department of Education and PBS Guam for their work and their commitment to our students. I'd also like to thank you students for participating at home. To your parents, I'd like to thank you for taking an active role in your child's education. We are all eager to return to a time when all of us can share and study together in person. Until then, we hope you learned something new from this PBS University instruction.